Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you all virtually to the Rockefeller Institute of Government. My name is Lee Wadanoya, and I'm Senior Policy Analyst at the Institute. Today's webinar, The Cost of Paperwork, is part of a larger series of webinars, discussions, forums, and reports delving into the relationship between benefits eligibility and the employment choices of people with disabilities in New York. This series is sponsored by NYSID and the New York Alliance for Inclusion and Innovation. The Rockefeller Institute has a long history of research into the employment of people with disabilities in New York, as well as the employment of the direct support professionals who work with them. I would like to thank Maureen O'Brien, President and CEO of NYSID, and Michael Seawriter, President and CEO of the New York Alliance for Inclusion and Innovation, for the opportunity to work on this research project. In addition to the forum series, we released a policy brief called Navigating the Benefits Cliff, which walks through some of the eligibility rules, work incentives, and work disincentives of the social safety net programs for people with disabilities, and that is currently available and public on our website. Before we start today's conversations, I'd like to make a few housekeeping notes. Um, the webinar will be recorded and available on both the Institute's YouTube channel, as well as our website for those who are unable to attend today or for anyone you'd like to share it with later. Each of our panelists will take part in a 10 minute moderated discussion followed by a shared Q&A. Please submit any questions you have using the Q&A tool located at the bottom of your screen. In addition to today's webinar, we have one more webinar on Friday, December 1st um, called Employment Support and the Information Ecosystem for Individuals with Disabilities, which will focus on how this information is transmitted through direct support professionals, benefits counselors, VR reps, et cetera. Um, the Rockefeller Institute will also be hosting an in-person forum at the Institute in Albany on Tuesday, July 9th from 12 to 1.30, um, which will examine policy solutions to support individuals with disabilities as they pursue employment. So lots to look forward to. Um, I'd now like to introduce today's moderator, Andrea Emerson. Andrea is instructional designer at Life Plan CCO and also the Advanced Care Alliance New York. Welcome, Andrea, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lee. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrea Emerson. As Lee stated, I'm an instructional designer with Life Plan CCO New York and ACA with a focus on benefits and entitlements, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. In today's webinar, we'll be taking a deeper look into restrictions placed on both employees with disabilities and their employers as they try and navigate the complicated landscape of the benefits programs. It's a sobering fact that the process of applying for benefits can be complex. In certain cases, such as Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, or Social Security Disability Insurance, um, SSDI, individuals may even find it necessary to engage the services of an attorney to successfully access the benefits to which they're entitled. But the challenges do not stop there. For those who are fortunate enough to secure these benefits, ongoing vigilance is required to ensure continued eligibility. This involves a delicate balancing act to keep their income and resources below program specific limits, a task that can be as challenging as it is crucial. Furthermore, when individuals with disabilities make the decision to enter the workforce, they often face the arduous task of regularly reporting their income. This in turn places an additional burden on their employers who must carefully manage the hours and compensation of their employees to prevent them from losing access to the very benefits designed to support them. Today, we are joined by professionals who will help us identify challenges and explore possible solutions. By better understanding the complex landscape of benefits programs and the obstacles they present, we can work towards a more equitable and supportive system for individuals with disabilities and the employers who stand beside them. So I'd like to first introduce our first panelist, Isabel Alexander Clavo. Isabel is a seasoned professional with 20 years of management experience. As of August, 2020, she's been serving as the executive director of Living Independently is for Everyone, that acronym is LIFE, at RCIL, furthering the agency's mission of ensuring equal access and participation in our community for all individuals with disabilities. LIFE comprises of three centers of independent living which cover Fulton, Herkimer, Montgomery, and Oneida counties. 
So welcome, Isabel. Why don't we begin by you um, giving us a little bit more information about your organization and the meaningful work that you do? Sure. Um, as mentioned, we are the Independent Living Center, um, which is a federally mandated uh, institution. It, it actually came out of the civil rights movement, um, but really didn't start fully until the ADA was signed in 1990. Um, our services, our employees, our board are all designed for people with living dis with disabilities, but also um, at least 50% of our agency has to be people living with disabilities. So it's for a, a by um, the community. Um, and our services include all ages, all disabilities. It can be for, for youth, two years old, um, adults, seniors living in nursing homes. Um, so we do have a range of services, but every service is in place to support the person, to ensure that they can live in the community of their choice and that their rights are uh, respected and that their rights are enforced. And a lot of people don't know what their rights are. So we ensure that they, they know what they are and they know what services are available to support them for their, for their choices. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we we fully cover Fulton, Herkimer, or Montgomery, and Oneida counties in New York. Uh, we have three centers that cover those four counties. Um, but if we have an individual who lives elsewhere, we will refer them to the uh, appropriate agency um, elsewhere in New York. Wonderful. Uh, so let's talk about how the administrative burden is not only for those in the workforce, but anyone who is living with a disability. So that, that's very complicated for some, some individuals. They don't realize um, the process. You know, when we have people coming in, they're asking about um, either benefits or what services are available. Um, sometimes by the time they get to us, they've been through so many other agencies or points of contact that it's, um, they're very frustrated with, with the system. And we're here to enable or, or to help them through the process. Um, people don't realize that there's, you know, there's doctor's appointments that are needed, there's documentation, they, they better keep all their receipts in some cases, um, the proof, you know, they had healthcare related costs. Uh, and that can, that can really be burdened from the people because not everything is clear either. Um, when we help individuals go through social security applications, um, sometimes it's not in plain language. Uh, and the even if there's a an interview with Social Security, a lot of times our advocates with with will be with the individual for that interview on the phone or, or something because they will uh, help with plain language because sometimes the interviewer won't ask a question in a way that the individual will understand. So we'll kind of you know for lack of a better term interpret that for them so mm -hmm. they can answer the question accurately and they can um, provide the information needed. Otherwise, um, sometimes when somebody's by themselves and they don't have that additional support, they might not provide the information that Social Security is interested in and then may end up with their application being denied. Um, and I think uh, some other parts of the burden is really just missing information. People don't realize what's out there. They don't realize what services are available. And they don't realize like the timeline that sometimes these things take. You know, sometimes they might think, oh, well, if I apply now, I might get it next next month or next week. And it doesn't really happen that way. So misinformation is, is an obstacle as well that people need to be well informed of the entire process for whichever um, service or support or benefit they may be looking into. Yeah, you bring up a great point in initially, if you're beginning the process to apply for the Social Security program, whether it's SSI or SSD or maybe a benefit off your parents' record, if you don't have an appointed authorized rep that's going to be on the phone with you to help kind of translate those questions, that can be a huge burden just in the first couple of minutes of that phone call because the individual is going to have to be prepared with answering certain identifying questions that they may not know the answers to, like their mother's maiden name or something like that. So there's a lot that goes into preparing them for that phone call. And if they can't answer those questions accurately, they may be forced to go into the office to do an in-person appointment. And that has its own challenges. 
you know, maybe transportation is a huge barrier. Correct. Transportation is a huge barrier for um, a lot of individuals, especially if they live in a rural com community, because public transportation isn't always as efficient or available for individuals. Right. Um, and, you know, so that's a little bit about starting the process. But even when somebody's in the process, they've already been they've already been approved for whatever benefit or service they're looking for. Um, sometimes it could be a burden for ongoing. Um, with Social Security, you know, there, there may be medical appointments that they have to, to do throughout a certain time frame or, or recurring time frame because they have to continuously prove that they're still disabled or they still have a disability. Uh, and that can be burdensome because one, it's not that easy to, to get a health appointment. Um, people don't realize, um, even if you have a primary care physician, um, sometimes, you, you know, you just can't get in there for an appointment and Social Security doesn't give enough uh, notice for when they want documentation. Um, they might not be able to get a certain, you know, report or checkup done in, in a certain time frame that Social Security is looking for. Um, so I think the proof of burden, uh, that that is a burden to provide that because of the time frames that are involved and just it's really um, problematic to have to continuously say that you have a disability, you know, especially on certain conditions conditions that are known that they're never going to go away. So right. have to every year or every three years have to say, yeah, I'm still I still have this disability, and here's the proof for it. Um, not only is that a burden, but it's also demoralizing because it's it's really having to prove that you're worth this particular benefit or service. 100% and a benefit that they're absolutely entitled to. And a lot of people don't realize that regardless of the severity of the disability, every beneficiary has to undergo a periodic medical review. So you could have somebody like my daughter, for instance, has cerebral palsy. So she's, I mean, she has good days and bad days, but she's always going to have cerebral palsy. And so if she were to have a medical review, it is, it does feel demoralizing that we have to prove after sending everything in not too long ago, you know, that that diagnosis still stands and she's still entitled to the services that she's getting. And so I, I totally agree with you. And the reporting responsibilities are an incredible burden for someone to bear, especially when you're working, but even when you're not working, you bring up like, you know, having to go to doctors for continuous medical reviews. If you're on the needs-based program, SSI, there's periodic um, non-medical reviews, which are those redeterminations that are a little more frequent, about every two years. So that requires you to get your bank statements and collect all of this information that can be so difficult for someone who has certain barriers, even transportation, going to see someone face-to-face, -face, or how they're going to connect and get that information that's required for Social Security to continue the benefits is definitely um, something to look at. And then, you know, obviously, if somebody is working, just the burden of reporting your income on a monthly basis can be can be very challenging. Exactly. And um, as far as, you know, individuals who are looking to work, um, that can be challenging for them as well, because if they are looking to work, they have to figure out, well, in order to keep benefits, if they need this benefit or service, or healthcare um, benefit. Um, what are the hours that would allow them to maybe start going back to work but not affect the benefits right away? Um, or they have to figure out, well, what kind of job am I able to get that can also work with my disability? Um, because that would cover all these needed costs. Um, you know, healthcare insurance, maybe they need a home health aid. You know, there's different things that are out there that people might be getting that even if they're working full time, unless it's a, a position that can cover all these things, there's a big fear of losing, you know, some, some of those benefits because a job may not be able to sustain it or cover it, or at least not right away. Absolutely. And you brought up, you know, misinformation being a huge barrier. And that's where all of that comes into play because, you know, the individuals seek out certain resources, expecting to get good information and accurate information that's not going to negatively impact their benefits. And although misinformation, I'm sure, is not intentional when it's given, people just don't realize that there's such specific nuances for each different entitlement program. 
and they don't, don't translate to one another. So what is an answer for SSI may be totally different for SSD. And so that can be very confusing when you're answering a question or if you are the individual asking the question, if you don't have a good handle on what benefits you're collecting and you know the different resource limits, income limits, all of those things that are associated with the different programs. So that's a great point. Yeah, and, and I think part of that is too, is um, you know, there's the information, the misinformation, but knowing who to look for, I think would be a great thing um, that can alleviate some of this burden. Um, as a center, we have benefits advisors um, that work with individuals and they look at every single service or benefit. Um, you know, they look at the differences between SSI or SSD or retirement, um, SNAP, whatever they might have to see how the different limits will affect that particular benefit. Um, and I think if people, more people knew that this service was out there, it could help alleviate some of that misinformation. That's a critical role to have someone who can step back and look at each entitlement that someone is receiving and know collectively where they need to keep their resources and what their income res and resource limit is. Because you may have, um, you know, somebody who's on SSI, so their resource limit's $2,000. Then you may have someone on SSD who um, is not on Medicaid. So Social Security does not impose a resource limit for that entitlement. But if you're on SSD and Medicaid, you have to keep your resources below $30,000. And if you're collecting a benefit off a parent and you're approved for DAC budgeting through Medicaid, you have to keep your resources below $2,000. And that's hard enough to keep track of for us. And we're immersed in this. So I can't imagine how difficult that must be for an individual with a disability to keep track of all of this and make sure that they're not doing anything that's going to jeopardize their benefits ongoing. So that's wonderful that you have benefits advisors there that are helping with that type of information because it's vital. Great. Is there anything else that we wanted to um, touch on that we haven't covered yet that you think would be important for the audience to know? Um, I think it's important that people realize that um, a lot of individuals who may be receiving benefits, um, even if they want to work, there is a big fear associated with that because of the potential loss of their service or their benefit um, and the time frame that it takes to get back to get them back. Um, sometimes if someone has a, a condition that maybe has flare ups and they might have a good period where they're fine, they, they're able to work, they can work full time. Um, but something might happen where, you know, they have a flare up and they're unable to continue working at that, at that position, the time frame it takes to get their benefits back, back is substantial. Even if it's quote unquote expedited, it still can be up to six months. And that is a real detriment to people who need that service or need that benefit. Um, and then there's six months of wondering how they're gonna pay for all their essential needs. So I think if, this, if there's more awareness on that, um, that this is a real concern for the community, um, I think it would help make changes with how the service works, how the benefit is um, given and the timeframes that are in place right now. I completely agree. Um, I think, you know, you brought up like an EXR and even that you're thinking expedited, but someone still without income is still going to have to find a way to pay all of their monthly bills. So I think maybe on the other side of it, the government knowing that there is a true sense of urgency here and they're entitled to, you know, you working through this case to get them their benefit back that they're entitled to because may have gone back to work, like you said, you were feeling good. And then because of your disability, you just can't sustain it anymore. That in the social security world is referred to as a failed work attempt. But sometimes, you know, the individuals don't know how to properly word it and they don't want to get in trouble if they were working and now they're not and they don't know, you know, the right language to use. So all of that is true. And I, I completely agree with that, especially the myth being if you do want to work and you go back to work, you're going to lose all of your benefits. That's not necessarily true because a lot of these programs are set up to give people the incentive to return to work if they want to. You just have to be familiar with what type of resources to, to enroll in so that you can continue to work and try it out and have it not impact your benefits for a certain period of time. So thank you so much. Thank you. So next we'll move on to our 
Other panelists, Chester Finn. Um, Chester is the individual and family advocate for the New York State Office of People with Developmental Disabilities, or OPWDD, and an advisor to Self-Advocacy Association of New York State. Chester has served three terms as national president of self-advocates becoming empowered, and he is the former president of SANYS. Chester currently serves on multiple boards, including the Council on Quality and Leadership, the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, and the Institute for Exceptional Care. So welcome, Chester. Why don't we start by you telling, a little, telling us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, thank you. Uh, as it says, I work for Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, OPWDD, and I've been doing that for a number of years, almost 25. Uh, I'm an advocate for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, I advocate all over the state. Uh, I ad advocate also nationally and internationally. So I'm kind of all over the place. Um, Social Security and you know SSI and SSDI has been important to me in my early life. Fortunately, now I don't have any of those services because I'm able to work and uh, make a living wage and as well as retirement from my from my job. And I'm happy about that. Um, when I first start, you know, got my job, I was worried about, you know, what's that going to do to my benefits and things. But I looked at it this way: hmm, I'm making, I'll be making more money than I've ever made in my life. I'll just have to learn how to manage. And you know, at first, for a few years, you would get those letters from Social Security. Oh, you owe us this, you owe us that. So to prevent that, I didn't, you know, how you can have that period of receiving Social Security while you, you know, work and then you eventually transition off. I think it's after nine months or a grace period or whatever. I didn't want any of that to happen because my thought in my mind was, look, I'm going to be making money, my own money, real money. I don't want them to come back and take my money. So I let them know early. I didn't need the services and that they could give it to someone that really needed it. So I'd be doing that my, you know, myself on what I made. And I'm fortunate enough to make a wage that helps me live and continue to live. So I haven't needed to um, have social security or anything like that since I, you know, started my job and I was fortunate enough to have the insurance from my job where I didn't have to, you know, worry about Medicaid and the doctors and things that I needed. But I do know that a lot of people that I know and a lot of my friends are not fortunate like that. I mean, they have so many problems, you know, navigating Social Security and SSI, SSDI, and, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing. And I know, you know, talking and working with people from Social Security, you know, on what it's like, you know, to advocate for more for individuals and families, and, you know, what people need in the support. It's going to take a lot more, but now, you know, they're making steps you know, to change things. You know, I have quite a few friends and people that I advocate now that are going through the social security system. And one of the things that really bothers me a lot is people are encouraged to kind of stay on social security or their benefits. And they kind of think that that's the only way that they can survive which, you know, we have programs that we have brought into New York State to kind of help with that. We've had uh, what we call 
at that time, Medicaid buy-in that we bought in with the federal government to kind of help people kind of keep their Medicaid while, while they could make, you know, a living wage. Unfortunately, with that, we don't have enough people employed to really take advantage of some of the things that's available to them because they're so worried about losing their benefits or getting cut off of Social Security. And one of the things talking to uh, SSI, it's what it says, supplemental income. It's supposed to help a person get started uh, maybe if they want to do a job and not a lifetime thing because it's, it doesn't sustain you throughout your life. You have all these rules and regulations. If you work and you make money, you know, for every dollar you get, you get a couple of dollars taken away and it doesn't help you kind of move forward. So you just stuck in this one place. I know that, you know, advocating on a uh, national level as well as, you know, the state level, you try to let people know that, you know, people want to work. They want to be able to, you know, buy the things that they want, you know, have homes and different things and, you know, live a uh, comfortable life. Because it's not easy waiting for a paycheck to come in every month and then you got to budget a whole life out of that. You got to pay for rent. You got to pay for all these things. As you know, things are going up. You know, you can't even buy a loaf of bread like you could before. You know, a couple of dollars will buy you, you know, a loaf of bread, a couple of loaves of bread. Now, you might pay $5 or more for some bread. And, you know, I know some people uh, we receive, you know, benefits to help with food and stuff like that. But even in those cases, sometimes that's, that's not enough because, you know, things are constantly going up. And I think it's for the agencies that I know and talk to people and work with, you know, it makes it, it makes it harder also on the person because they pay a large amount of what they, you know, earn through Social Security, what they're giving them, a lot of that goes, you know, to the agency to take care of the things that they need, you know, at their houses and, you know, utilities and all that stuff. So it only allows a person, like, you know, under, you know, a couple of hundred dollars for their budget, even though they get you know, clothing allowance or something like that. So, right. you know, there's a lot of things that we have to consider and really be able to talk to Social Security about around the lives of people. I mean, it, it's surviving, but it's almost like being in the water and trying to hold your, your hands up not to drown so the water can't cover you up and worry about when is that going to happen. You know, it's not, it's not a good life. It's not perfect for people. We got to figure out together how to change things instead of waiting for, you know, people to change things for us. You know, that's why we have representatives in our state legislature and we have people in Congress that supposed to advocate for our, you know, needs and things. You know, the first thing you hear when there's, you know, an election or something like that, you know, they, they scare people with disabilities. We're going to cut off Social Security, or we're going to cut Social Security, we're going to cut Medicaid, we're going to cut the benefits. And that makes a lot of people worried. You know, what am I going to do? Just like now, a lot of people are worried about their living situations. And it's not easy. You know, we have to figure out a way together how to change things, how to impress on Social Security that it's important 
that people had lives. I have a lot of friends now that have been, you know, lost their social security, lost their, their SSI. And it's so hard for them to get back on, even though we have attorneys out there to help them and work with them. I have a friend, I went with him down the social security because we called and filled out an application online. And we went down there. I said, it's probably better if they can see you and see your face and know who you are. You know, that helped him. But, you know, the attorney was supposed to help him. And they sent him a letter about that he was going to receive a certain amount of money. And he waited and waited and waited. It never came. And, you know, what the attorney helped him work out was combining the SSI and SSDI with, he wanted it to come into two different accounts so that he could have some money and not just rely on his um, rep payee, which was his family, which works with him on getting those things done. It didn't, it didn't work that way. You know, it kind of ended up that he was a little less than what he had before. Those kind of barriers that you know are put in front of people that every day watching people you wouldn't know. And sometimes people say, Oh, you're fortunate, you have this, you have that. My child don't have this, my child don't have that. But it's up to all of us to teach each other and work with each other on these things that you need. And for me, it's so important to work with all the people that are receiving services from us. And I would like to say thank you to our CIL. They were one of the agencies uh, across the state that worked with us when we first started uh, self-determination, which now turned into uh, self-direction. You know, they were one of our fiscal and intermediaries and they worked with people and they had uh, peer managers and brokers and stuff to help people live a better lives, you know? And that's what we have to do. We have to put pressure, we have to talk to Social Security about what's needed for people. And a lot of people don't understand, and I was told a long time ago, it's like, keep good records. If you get information from Social Security, record that, make you a copy of that, keep a folder of that, because at the time, they were saying that Social Security didn't keep records like we keep of our information and stuff. And if you could prove something and you had the proof of what was sent to you, you could show them. I don't know about now. You know, they have computers and things like that. And, you know, coming up with <laughs> and things like that, they should have a better uh, system. But I do have friends that worked for Social Security. And we had lots of meetings there to talk about how to change things for not only people with intellectual and development of disabilities, but all persons with uh, disabilities that receive services. You know, and there's a difference between, you know, I'm also uh, visually impaired, you know, it's, it's the services I would get from Social Security is different than what my friends might get. But the only reason for that is the visually impaired and blind community worked hard to advocate in Washington and work with our legislators to impress on, on them how important it was for our lives. And that's what we have to do all over. You know, solution I have is we got to work better together with direct support professionals, DSPs, agencies to understand what we all go through and how to change things. My whole thing is you might know the problems, have the problems, but what solutions can you come up with to change things and that we all can change things? You know, my motto is what can I do to help? If I can't do it, I can't do it by myself, but who can? Who can I partner with? Who can I work with to change things? 
you know, that's the solutions that I would say that would be important on this panel to tell Social Security, to work with Social Security, show them what's happening in people's lives and what they have to go through and what their struggles are and some solutions about how to work with it and change it. You know, that would be what I would recommend because we all know all the problems and we might know someone that's having a hard time, but what can we do to change things and make it better for people and enable people to be able to work because that's so important. You know, that's what I'm doing right now with my agency. We're coming up with some jobs for people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities to be able to help OPW with GD in the state and you know all of the other people with disabilities and to you know serve as an example because talking to each other and talking to my friends and people that I know and encouraging them is the best medicine that I know to cure the problem of SSI and SSDI and get involved. Absolutely, because at the end of the day, it truly is not enough to live on. If you're on the needs based program, being SSI for 2023, the maximum that you can get in just federal funds, excluding the New York State program, is $914. And sure, there are programs that can help offset the cost of food and things like that, like SNAP. But I think right now, for an individual living in the community, the maximum allowance is like $291 or something. So it's impossible to pay all of your bills, pay for the items that food stamps doesn't cover that you need for hygiene and things like that and live a meaningful life. And then the biggest issue with the SSI program right now, I think is that the resource limit hasn't changed since what, 1988, I think it was. So yes. although the monthly federal benefit rate continues to increase each year with the cost of living adjustment, the resource limit has remained at $2,000. So it doesn't give anyone the incentive to save for a you know, bigger ticket item. It just keeps them at poverty level. So those are the meaningful conversations that we need to have with the people who can control those aspects of the program. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us and hearing your story. Next, I'd like to introduce Howard Gross. Howard is the founder and CEO of eBiz Docs, a capital district business founded in 1999 that currently employs roughly 40 individuals with disabilities. Howard has been recognized by the nonprofit mentorship group Best Buddies for his outstanding commitment to empowering individuals with disabilities through employment in the business community. So welcome, Howard. Thank you. You bring, you bring a unique perspective because you're an employer. So We'll start by uh, hearing a little bit more about your business and uh, the individuals that you employ. Sure, it's kind of like which one is not like the others. I'm, I'm the odd duck out here. Um, I'm not an expert, I am an entrepreneur. I am trying to create opportunities for people with disabilities and those without disabilities and, and navigate the systems, both the, the systems we're talking about here as well as all the other programs that employers have to deal with, be it OSHA, be it uh, workers comp, there's all these other aspects to running a business and hiring employees. This is just one of them. Um, we are, um, and it goes without saying, we are a NYSID corporate partner. So thank you to NYSID and the Alliance for Inclusion and Innovation for sponsoring this and Rockefeller Institute, um, because I think that this is a really important issue and, and it needs to get to the grassroots, not to just the other fellow experts on the panel here and the audience. We need to get this to the chambers of commerce and the people that are hiring people and dealing with these issues. It, it's surprising to me that I'm gonna be the first person to mention the three pay, payroll month, right? This is a huge issue for people. This happens this month, right, in December, which is even worse because it's a holiday bonus month or year, a yearly bonus for my employees which totally sucks. So I have to figure out a way to balance that, um, to compensate them legally, right? And, 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 and make it work in a three paycheck month, which is pretty impossible, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, right? And those that know, know what a three paycheck month is. 
Um, so there's a lot of issues that we're dealing with on a regular basis, trying to balance, um, you know, trying to pay a living wage. Our starting salary for our employees is $15 an hour, goes to 19 to $20 an hour. Um, all that means for most of my folks that are on SSI or SSDI is the more they make, the less they work. It's it's not as if there's an incentive for me to pay them more because they're just going to be limited by the number of the amount of money that they can make. One of the ways that we've resolved that here or tried to compensate for that is we have a retirement plan, a 401k. In the beginning, nobody was con very few people with disabilities were con contributing to the retirement. They didn't want to give up any cash. Right. Right. So we mandate we we now automatically out of uh, we put three percent into everybody's retirement plan non voluntary we we do it from the company part if they put an additional three percent they'll get a six percent contribute an additional six percent for the company so the company will give them six if they put in three it's still like twisting arms to get people to want to do this but it, it, those are the things that businesses are trying to do. You know, health insurance is crazy expensive for everybody. Nobody wants to give up the government um, health programs. I mean, they're they're the best out there for, for, for my employees. So I'm stuck. You know, I can't, we can't motivate people to to want to do a lot of great things because there's no, there's nothing at the end of the day. They're still stuck with the same paycheck they have. And it's very, 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 very frustrating. Very frustrating. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, you say you're not an expert, but I'm sure in the position that you're in, you were forced to become an expert and think of creative ways in order for the individuals that you employ to not jeopardize their benefits. And so what Howard was saying, the three paycheck months is that depending on the frequency in which you're paid, when you have five weeks in a month, that could mean three biweekly paychecks or five weekly paychecks. And for someone, um, you know, on SSI or even SSD, if that extra paycheck makes them exceed the income threshold, they're not going to be eligible for benefits that month. So they have to plan accordingly for that and budget how they're going to make up that loss. And, and to add to that, you know, we hire a, a number of folks with developmental disabilities. They have enough to worry about to get to work, to get up for childcare, all these other things. They don't have the time, the patience to kind of worry about all those other things. Like it's a three paycheck. So if you look at our, our employee calendar, it identifies when there's a three paycheck month, we've hired a job coach on our staff to help support people with those issues because we're not getting that support. You know, 20 years ago when I started, there were a, job coaching was rampant. You know, you had an unlimited number of hours there. Everybody, you could you tripped over job coaches. Now you can't find them. And, and this is not a beat. I'm not beating anybody up. But, you know, we had to take the bull by the horns and deal with it ourselves. So we're bringing in in-house experts on the payroll to say, you got to manage this because these are valuable employees to us. We need to make sure they can they, they stay and they and they they're happy. Right. And you obviously know what you're doing. So you know that you have to let them know that this is a five week paycheck month coming up in Chester's situation. It sounds like he was very proactive with reporting. You know what? It looks like I'm going to earn more than I'm allowed to in this month. I'm looking to terminate my benefits because I don't want to get into that world of overpayments and waivers and all of that. So you have on one end when you're just, you know, I'm not going to do it anymore because of the administrative burden. But then if you're not, and you do get overpaid, that opens up a whole other issue of how do I now deal with requesting a waiver for the overpayment, requesting an appeal, submitting all of the documentation that's required for them to even look at it to say, is this a true overpayment? Do you truly owe us this money back? Because there's many reasons why it could not be a true overpayment. And it's so stressful. And even if you have a payee who you think maybe you know a lot of the responsibility would lie on that payee, a lot of times it's a family member like Chester's friend and they're there to manage the money. They're not knowledgeable in all of the other nuances that go along with the program and how critical reporting can be in certain areas. Sure. And the same thing goes with, um, you know, New York now we're, we've always paid sick time and, and vacation time. It's a whole new concept to some of our employees. A lot of our employees, it's their first job. We are their first employment source right and and that and we're teaching them everything so we're kind of learning together as well as their guardians because that's a whole nother co complexity to the employment package when you're dealing with folks as they enter the workplace so there's a lot of education that goes on and and it's very fractured 
as far as experts around the area. We can't go to one single source. You go to multiple sources and everything kind of gets divided up. And um, we try to handle that as much as we can, but that's not our job. So exactly. while the concept is here, the cost of paperwork, it's really the cost of employment, right? And, and are we on, are we not employing as many people as we can because we're creating a bureaucracy that is just disincenting employment? Uh, and, and once you get burned the first time, why would you want to go back? So mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we streamline this process and create ombudsmen and experts in the field that it's a one call and they take care of it? And I'm happy to make that call as the employer and bring that person because it's easier for me to do it. And, and, and my fellow in, um, business owners would be happy to do it. It's just like ADA. You know, we joke with, with um, you know, ADA, everybody said, oh, years ago, it was a big pain. You know, nobody wanted to do it. We weren't opposed. We, we we think it's great. And I explain it to people that, that say, oh, it's a it's it's a lot of answer. It's like you hire somebody in a wheelchair, you're gonna save money. You don't have to buy a wheel a chair for that person. You they already come with a chair, right? You're saving money day one. There's a lot of ways to it's all perspective. And I think right. that we need to look at this as a more um forward thinking concept. How do we get more employees into the workforce? Because they the current employees, a lot of the next group. They're not the best. And this is across the board. It's not the best employee source we have out there right now. So I'm going to do everything I can to keep the ones I have and to make them more valuable. So if we can increase thresholds, if we can mm -hmm. streamline the process, those are all things I'm all for. Absolutely. And understanding the programs, like we're saying, is so complicated that when an individual gets a letter from social security and maybe it says your benefits are ending. That's such a daunting task, but there's so much that goes into that, getting that letter that could have gone wrong along the way that maybe that's not entirely true, but you don't know that until you can get in touch with someone at social security, which seems to be a barrier in itself at this point and get someone who specializes in your unit or the type of program that you're collecting off of to really have them take the time to explain why are my benefits being cut off? And then you may often find that they're not supposed to be cut off, that, um, I don't know, maybe they have proof that you exceeded the resource limit, but it was because of a tax refund, you know, and they don't have that information. But having someone who's knowledgeable in all of that, I completely agree with you. There's such a need for someone who can speak fluently about social security, how employment impacts it, and really act as a liaison between the two entities, the individual and the employer and social security, because there seems to be a huge disconnect. Absolutely. And all of the frustration falls on the individuals and their employees. And speak English to me. Don't talk to me about programs and abbreviations and all this alphabet soup, because I don't need to, that's not what I do. I make payroll. I don't deal with all these other little things. So tell me what I need to do as an employer and I'll follow it. But don't make it complicated. Absolutely, well said. Is there anything else that we didn't touch on that you think is important for the audience to know? No, I, th I think that this is a, a, a real big issue and I think it's a barrier to employment for more and more people. You know, mm -hmm. and New York has, has instituted a living wage and that's just gonna, that's gonna keep, as it continues to go up, the hours that you can work. You know, if, this isn't the South where somebody can make you know eight dollars an hour and work full time. This is sixteen dollars an hour. You, you you're working twenty hours at best. Exactly. Yes. All right. Thank you, Howard. Now we're going to move on to our last panelist, Simeon Goldman. He serves as a general counsel at the Independent Living Center for the Hudson Valley. Simeon has been working for the rights of people with disabilities since 1988. He advises the government, employers, advocates, healthcare providers, and housing providers on complying with these laws. He has taught many attorneys and advocates how to effectively represent and empower their clients. So welcome, Simeon. Do you want Thank to take you. a moment to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, sure, I'll try to keep, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, I'm, I'm currently the general counsel here at the Independent Living Center for the Hudson Valley in Troy. So uh, like uh, Isabella, I'm also with an independent living center. And I think uh, this type, this is so consistent with the philosophy of independent living, which is, uh, you know, you've heard, you know, give a person a fish, they eat for a day, teach them a fish, they eat for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're teaching people to fish. And uh, as, as Isabella and Howard 
and Chester have all very eloquently uh, expressed, we're setting up you know, un unbelievable amounts of unnecessary barriers to people becoming more productive and uh, in independent. For most of my career, um, I worked as a, an attorney or a supervising attorney at uh, <clears throat> Disability Rights New York, formerly Disability Advocates. And one of my uh, roles there was uh, running the PABS program, the Protection and Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Security. So in that role, and a little bit before that as, as, as well, uh, in another program, uh, I had the opportunity to assist a lot of people in dealing with overpayments because we argued this was a huge barrier to work, not just for the person who was getting that lovely notice that says, please pay us back $45,000 within the next 30 days, but for their whole circle of friends and acquaintances and coworkers. Because when people hear this, they get, excuse my language, scared shitless. And it's not irrational. It's, it, it's, a, it's right. a perfectly reasonable res, res, response to that. Uh, so that's that's my background. I'll let you ask me other questions. Well, I think you bring up a huge issue being overpayments and how to avoid overpayments and how to deal with an overpayment if you do get a notice of overpayment. So maybe you can speak to some of the things that you have found that can help um, prevent an overpayment as far as reporting responsibilities and things like that? Yeah, I mean, it's axiomatic that if you're, if, if you're working and you're receiving benefits, whether SSI, definitely SSI, but SSD uh, as well, is you have to report right. your income. Uh, sometimes that is easier said than done. And some offices make it easier than others, but that has to be done. Uh, that's your first line of protection in the event of an overpayment, not that that in and of itself is going to prevent you from being liable for the overpayment. So that's, that's critically uh, important. What a lot of folks understandably do when they get those notices that I alluded to earlier is they panic and maybe they freeze and they, they put it aside. That is not what you want to do. Uh, there are there are time frames on uh, when you for when you can apply. Well, well, you can you can both challenge the overpayment is wrong, saying I wasn't overpaid, I was entitled to it, and you could or you can seek you can say I was overpaid, but there's a good reason why I shouldn't have to pay it back. Yeah, uh, which is which is which is more common, but it's important to remember both. And we've, we've you know, over the years uh, had success, you know, in both, both ways. Um, once you start on the, um, on, on either or both of those tracks, the good news is if you are working with a, a skilled advocate or an attorney, you're gonna have somebody who is walking you through it. Uh, it could take years. Uh, give you an example. I, we were contacted years ago by a, a man who had his own business through the uh, program that assists people who are blind with setting up their own um, uh, stores, like on the plaza in Albany and in, in, the, um, in, the, in the legislature, um, in the Capitol. He contacted us with an overpayment of approximately $140,000, wow. which would have destroyed him and his family. Since he was considered self-employed, the rules are somewhat different. I'm not going to get into them here. But since self-employment is relatively rare among beneficiaries, there are only a handful of people within the Social Security Administration nationwide that understand how all those rules work. It took a while, but fortunately, there was someone in the Albany office, that one person that really understood it. It involved going to eight, you know, the Commission for the Blind, a whole number of agencies, an incredible amount of, of, of beyond what most people are going, certainly beyond what almost any individual for themselves would have been able to do.
do. And even for me as an attorney, this was complicated. And I'm an attorney who's been practicing now for 35 years. I do federal court litigation. I can tell you, this is complicated. It's ridiculously complicated. Mm -hmm. So it took forever, but not only did we get the $140,000 overpayment waived, they ended up owing it about $15,000. <laughs> uh, but that, you know, I wish I could tell you that was typical. It's not typical. That, that, that's the exception. Um, I had another horrible case I'm going to share with you just to show you what the impact of this can be. Um, I worked with a woman who had a $160,000 overpayment, and she was a woman who she was receiving benefits on the basis of mental illness. She had terrible anxiety and depression. I would talk to her every week or two weeks for years, years, and it was really weighing on her. And it was bleeding into every aspect of her of her life. Finally, after years, I can't tell you exactly how many, we succeeded in getting the entire $160,000 overpayment waived. Sadly, the damage was done. And, and two weeks after that, she took her own life. Oh, gosh. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and wave a bloody flag and say, Social Security or anybody killed her. But what, what, what I am going to say is we need to realize that we're dealing with human beings. And this is more than most people can handle. And like what, what, you know, when I listen to Isabella and what RCIL is doing, that's fantastic. But the fact of the matter is there are not enough Isabellas and RCILs or ILCHVs here where, where, where I work to handle all of these cases. And there are just so many, even if you have an advocate, and, and this plays into a lot of much larger issues. If you have an advocate in most agencies, this area is going to take a period of years to get good at it. Not-for-profits are starved for money. They are not able to pay wages to keep people for years. The turnover is just too darn much. So it's, it's, it is so difficult to find somebody who is able to shepherd, to help somebody to, to shepherd them through this overpayment process successfully. Uh, even if, you know, someone like myself or the current PABS attorney at DRNY is able to provide them with some backup. So that that we that that that's superimposed on the problem. Uh, 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 I mean, I think we lost you for a moment. Can you hear him okay, Lee, or is it just on my end? Misinformation. Uh, this was alluded to by others. Misinformation. They they, they need to. You know, the, it was the 800 number for Social Security has been historic. Simeon, I'm just going to stop you for a moment. It seems like we may have a bad connection. You're in and out. We're not able to hear you right now. We'll wait for Simeon to come back hopefully with a stronger connection. But the last thing that he brought up before we lost him was misinformation. And I know we touched on that earlier, but that can be the root of a lot of causes of overpayments too. If someone is given bad information about what their income threshold is or what their resource limit is or anything related to programmatic eligibility rules and the individual thinks they're acting in good faith and following all the rules and then they get one of those notices in the mail, it can be extremely frustrating. And so just knowing that if you are working with someone or you are someone who is a beneficiary and you do get a letter of overpayment, you do have the option of filing a waiver. You can also absolutely pursue the appeals process. There's different levels of appeals. But I would always encourage you to start with the waiver process. Great. Okay, so you were just talking about, about misinformation before we lost you. Well, yeah. We can hear you now. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what happened. Uh, I apologize. All right, I'm getting a note saying That's internet okay. connections. 
We'll give just a couple seconds. It seems like you're in and out again. Um, where was I? The, yes, the, the, if need be, I can call in. Tell me if you want me to do that. All right. Okay, what do you think, Lee? Um, the other, I'm gonna, yeah, thank you. All right, All right you know what, let, let, let phone under to call in. Okay. I think we'll be, we'll give you. Do you have the number handy? Do you have the phone number? Lee, do you have the phone the number phone for number? him to call in and join us? Perfect. She's going to send it to you. Thank you. All right. I will do that. Great. Okay. Um, so we were talking about, we'll wait for uh, Simeon to call in and join us. And I think we had left off with, um, you do have the option to file a waiver which is specific to overpayments. And you just have to prove that the overpayment wasn't your fault and that you don't have the means to pay it back. There's a packet, of course, there's a packet that you have to fill out in order to state your case and usually have to give like a statement of household expenses and things like that, depending on which program you're collecting off of. But always start there because as Simeon can attest, even the largest of overpayments can be waived because there's a lot of investigation that goes into why the person was overpaid, what attempts they made to report their income, and why it isn't their fault, and judging by their household expenses, why they don't have the means to pay that back. I always get a kick out of the overpayment notices because it says you owe us $165,000, and then they have an audacity, the audacity that put like a, a slip at the, on the last page if you want to pay by check or card just to let them know, and if you want to send in your payment that way as if you have the means to pay that all in itself. So just know that that is available um, because the overpayment process can be very scary, especially for someone who has a larger overpayment of that amount. Um, because if you don't address it, I mean, realistically, the government does have the ability to eventually take like your tax return after a couple of years. If social security hasn't been notified in order to talk about the overpayment or if it the overpayment does stand, um, you know, work out a, a payment plan in order to pay it back, usually those overpayments default to a 10% collection rate and they want all overpayments paid back within 36 months. So that gives you an idea of what your monthly payment would be. But if you decide, here we go. I am on the phone now. Great. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I apologize. Uh, I don't know what happened with, with, with that. Uh, what we were discussing was the um, problem with misinformation, and I also wanted to say a, a huge problem is the uh, is, is technology. Uh, Social Security is on the cutting edge of 1985 for technology. Um, the inability to email with them, even though I realize that is uh, also largely due to their uh, understandable concern with, uh, with, with, with privacy, is a huge barrier. Uh, faxing is horribly inefficient. Uh, mail is, it, it, it often doesn't get read. Uh, so th that acts as a tremendous barrier. Um, Howard alluded to the three paycheck month. Uh, I saw that all the time and people getting overpayments. Also, something else for, for anyone who's listening who does this work, keep in mind, interest rates have gone up on bank accounts. People that are sitting with, you know, $1,970 in their account, um, they, they could, on interest alone, he head over 2000 and end up with, an, you know, ha ha being asked to repay several months of benefits for being, you know, a few dollars over $2,000, which is, you know, horribly horribly unfair but it happens can you get it waived yes but you but you have to you have to work at it uh so you know these are these are things to avoid uh i think critical that they that that uh there be people that can shepherd and guide people through this process um and that the misinformation it has to stop as a matter of fact I, i'll tell any of you out there who are in this field, you, you've heard doctors told first, do no harm. Anytime you're, anyone is asking you for advice and the first thing you're thinking in your mind is, well, I guess or I think, 
Don't say that. Say, I don't know. Let me look it up and get back to you. Because I can't tell you how many horrible messes I've seen that have resulted from people with the best of intentions giving people incorrect information. Um, so my last, my last push is just a thing to say, is this going to be this? We wouldn't have a lot of, a, a lot of this complexity with healthcare, which is what this is about for a lot of people keeping their, 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 their Medicaid and, and their Medicare benefits and forgetting SS, SSD. If we had some type of a universal healthcare system that wasn't tied to either public benefits or, um, or need-based benefits or, or, or employment, uh, it really shouldn't be a part of this, but it, it is, and it's probably not going to change in the uh, foreseeable future. So we need to have the resources out there to guide people, and we need to be able to connect people with those resources. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you, Simeon. Um, so I just want to thank all of the panelists. I think we can move into the Q&A portion of our discussion today. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to answer them live. Um, so the first question that came through, um, has any state allowed continuous benefits regardless of income if one is permanently disabled? And that's a great question. Um, does anybody on the panelists want to answer that? Well, I, I well, if you, if you, it's a federal program, so um, the, a state wouldn't have the ability to um, to, to do to do that. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, um, the when you're approved for a disability benefit, whether it be SSI or SSD, you are subject to periodic medical reviews, regardless of income, regardless of your diagnosis. The frequency of those reviews are determined when you're first approved for benefits. Um, so most commonly you're medically reviewed every three, five or seven years. But that's not to say that if you've been on the program for 10 years, you've never been contacted for a medical review that you're doing something wrong because those workloads, they're so behind on them. But most commonly you can expect your case to be medically reviewed at some point and it should be ideally every three, five or seven years, just to show that you're continuously seeking medical treatment for your disability. Um, and they'll have you fill out the information, like if you've had any recent hospitalizations pertaining to your disability, if you're on medications, what the medications are for, who prescribes them, the last time you saw a doctor, if you have a future appointment scheduled, when the last time what, you know, so there's a lot that goes into it. And that also can be a huge administrative burden to a beneficiary on these programs, just to ensure that benefits continue. So it's very important if Social Security sends you to one of their physicians, usually the IMA group, um, that you keep that appointment or you are seeking continuous medical care for, like through your own physician, if that's the case. I would just add um, one of the things Sim said, and it's important is it's the healthcare benefit that a lot of people are 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 sticking for. And if there is a way to work around keeping that, or even ask the employer and the employee to 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 subsidize some of those costs, to be able to increase their hours worth, their wages paid, that would be a huge win for everybody because everybody knows work mm -hmm. is the best medicine. Everybody. Um, is happier, healthier, they're socializing, they're doing a lot of great things when they're in the workplace. When you're stuck home, you're not doing any of those things. Right. Except being miserable, you're not back at the office or, or working with your, hanging with your friends. So I think if we can come up with some creative ways to maintain the health coverage um, while increasing the wage base, that would be awesome. That's a great suggestion because currently as it stands, um, some of the work incentive programs that are offered will like start with Medicaid. Chester was talking about the Medicaid buy-in program for working people with disabilities. This is a great program that Medicaid offers that allows individuals to work to exceed the traditional Medicaid income limit um, to avoid paying a spend down and you can maintain your Medicaid coverage. The income threshold right now for that program I don't know the exact figure off the top of my head, but I think it's up to like $73,000 a year. 
So that's substantial that's income right. that you can continue to work and not jeopardize your Medicaid. Say that again, Sim. I know I said that that that's correct. It's it's like almost seventy four thousand dollars a year. Um, I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember bef before there was a Medicaid buy-in, and when sixteen nineteen B and A and B uh, came in, and for all the criticism of, of these programs and their complexity, it's great that we have these things now because they didn't exist at all back before the mid 1980s. And it was absolutely, it was all or, it was all or nothing for both cash benefits and healthcare, although you could get Medicaid, you could get Medicaid based on, on, on poverty um, alone. And, but now you can keep your Medicare for you know, years after you go back to work if you were a yeah. FBI beneficiary. I always forget about 1619 A and B. I'm glad you brought that up. So that's a great program where you know you may not be entitled to a cash benefit from Social Security, but you can continue to maintain your Medicaid eligibility. Um, and then, like Sim said, if you're losing SSD based on work, it's very different than losing your SSD because of a non-favorable medical decision. So your Medicare coverage after that is a very if when. So you'll get a letter in the mail. That, I mean, I've seen Medicare coverage continue for up to seven years after somebody lost their SSD. So there are programs available. It's just accessing them. And like Sim said, finding someone at those local field offices who's well-versed in those programs to give you the information that you need to accurately enroll and maintain. As far as wages go, um, I'm sure you're familiar with IRWIs, Impairment Related Work Expenses, or BWIs for Blind Work Expenses. Those are ways that the individual who's working for those costs that they incur to work can lower the amount of their countable wages. There's the Ticket to Work program that Social Security offers where you can exceed SGA, Substantial Gainful Activity, which is the income threshold for Title II benefits, and continue to collect your social security payment without penalty for nine months. Those nine months do not have to be consecutive, but if you exceed a certain amount in that given month, that's gonna count as one of your nine. After your nine, there's, there's grace periods that they can offer. It's not, you know, you have to make a decision right then and there if you're gonna to continue to work or continue to receive benefits. So there are a lot of programs, but we can still do a lot of work in um, enhancing the ones that are currently available. I actually want to, hey, Andrea, I'd want to highlight, we have a couple more program. We do have a couple more program specific questions that I'd like to highlight. Um, first is we have a question about ABLE accounts and how they interact with um, the work and the benefits. Is, is anyone, and we can move from that into, um, we can move directly from that into um, impairment related work expenses and some of those other carve outs that allow people to make more money. Um, I think that would be a good place to start if anyone wants to jump in. Sure, I can speak to ABLE accounts. So ABLE accounts are achieving a better life experience accounts. Um, they're becoming a lot more popular because you're able to use the money in an ABLE account for qualified disability expenses, which tends to be less strict than what you can use funds included in a trust for. But it's an account where the money included and held at that account does not count towards the resource limit. So it allows you to exceed the resource limit without penalty. Um, there are certain nuances, um, such as an annual contribution limit. So I think right now you can't deposit over, I want to say $15,000 in a given year. Um, so if you have someone who thinks that they are going to exceed the resource limit, again, there are accounts available, being an ABLE account or a trust that will allow them to do so and not impact eligibility for needs-based programs. The amount that somebody is going to deposit or the amount that someone maybe has inherited or the amount you know, that somebody has that's gonna make them ineligible will kind of dictate which route they should go, whether it's an ABLE or a trust or, or things like that. Um, and they have people that can absolutely work with you to find out 
what the best option would be for you and your situation. And the New York ABLE account website is a wonderful resource. I believe it's mynewyorkable.org. Um, they have a resource line that you can call and they can answer any question that you may have about ABLE accounts. So the other question was about impairment related work expenses. And I would just, can our panelists just in general talk about some of the carve outs, right? So not every dollar of earned income you make counts towards that earnings limit. And there are specific situations in which there are carve outs, which, you know, add to this administrative burden is you have to document these expenses. Does anyone want to talk about it, what an impairment related work expense is or their experience helping folks work through them? Well, I can I talk mean, a little Impairment bit. related work expense. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say what some of the impair what's considered impairment related work expenses. Um, it is a cost, it could be the cost of co pays or medications or counseling services, um, maybe some assistive technology. Um, or modifications that, that may be made um, or attentive care service like a home health aid, like some of these services that wouldn't be covered elsewhere. Um, these costs can be deducted from the, the amount that the person is making and, um, you know, any out-of-pocket expenses could be deducted so it wouldn't count against, against the person's monthly income but they would have to keep record of all those costs, you know, like the doctor's co-pays or, or the medications and keeping those receipts um, so they can provide that. So uh, Social Security can, can deduct the costs uh, from the month. Yep. It's important for two things also, because it's important in calculating uh, if you're getting SSI, you know, under 1619A, how much you're your benefits going to, to be, but it's also important in terms of determining whether you're, you're meeting the substantial gainful activity limit because you can use the earlies that that could be excluded. So um, for, for both of those things, it's, it's very important to, to carefully take a look at those, uh, those expenses for somebody who is getting back into the workforce. Absolutely. So if you do have a month that has three paychecks and you're going to exceed SGA, but you have documented earlies that can be used to reduce the amount of those countable wages that could bring you under SGA, absolutely. You know, it's in terms of the three paycheck month, the other problem that, that you have, which is similar, is a lot of people don't work the same number of hours every week or every month. And there's a two-month lag in the the way at least there was when I last did it uh, in, in the, the way they do their accounting at Social Security. So somebody may you know put, put in a few extra hours, think it's fine, and then you know two months later they find out they've you know gone over SGA and they're no longer in their trial work period if it's SSD, or they're um, you know they they were overpaid and uh, under under 1619A and then they have to pay money back. That they don't have and most of let's be honest most of the people that we're working with are they're not able to set aside lots of money uh they're, they're living hand to mouth and they and, and they don't have it so uh you know th those are all things to keep in mind right and like we brought up not every dollar that you earn is going to be used against you so for ssi specifically the needs-based program they'll exclude more than half of your gross wages before it starts to impact your benefit amount. There's a formula that they use, um, not to get too in the weeds, but there's a, a $20 general disregard that they'll deduct from your monthly gross earnings. Then there's a $65 disregard if it's earned income, which obviously wages are. And then they divide the balance in half. Um, and that's gonna be the amount of the countable wages that they'll deduct from the federal benefit uh, rate to arrive at what the benefit amount is going to be. So it can be very complicated, but if you have someone who's thinking about going back to work and they're aware that more than half of their gross wages are gonna be excluded, 
before it starts to impact your benefit amount, it will always pay off to work and collect benefits until you're going to go over the income threshold, then you have a decision to make. But I mean, with that formula, you're going to end up with more money in your pocket each month if you're working and collecting. I do want to follow up on one question. We had a question about um, 1619A, which we've mentioned a couple times. Could someone walk through just exactly what that is for the audience? I think uh, Andrea just did. <laughs> that, that Perfect. <laughs> Got to well, keep it in context. So 1619. Go ahead. Sorry. No, that's okay. Just to reiterate, um, you're not receiving a cash benefit from Social Security, but they're still allowing you to be eligible for the Medicaid health insurance, which if you're approved for SSI, your Medicaid becomes active through SSI, which prevents you from needing to recertify for Medicaid on an annual basis. So if you have SSI and Medicaid, as long as your SSI remains in pay each and every month, you never have to recertify for Medicaid. So if you have someone who loses the SSI portion, there is a way through this program that you can continue to be eligible for Medicaid. That's 1619B. 1619A is when you also oh. get keep your cash benefits as well, just so people are clear. Thank you, Sim. I think this highlights some of the navigating paperwork that is necessary when you have all of these overlapping programs. Um, I do, we do have one uh, more specific question from uh, Melinda about, and it's, it's a specific question and we can answer that as well, but I wanna sort of broaden the question a little bit to every, to the panelists because the question focuses on what happens basically when a family or an individual does not reveal their true financial situation and works with another external organization and what is the external organization's responsibility for dealing, you know, with those misstatements or, you know, that forgotten process. Um, so I was wondering if any of our panelists want to talk a little bit about those sort of overlapping levels of responsibility in this space. It's partially going to depend on whether the external organization is functioning as a representative payee or not. Uh, I, I, and I'm, I'm doing this off the top of my head, and I, I guess I am an attorney and general counsel, but take this for what it's worth, because I, I'm not out loud here. Uh, if, if, they're not, if you're not a rep payee, I, I think you can reasonably rely on, you know, the assurances of your, um, of, of your consumers or your, or your clients. Um, I think if they tell you something that's out, you know, if, if you see them pull up driving a brand new, you know, Mercedes and they tell you they, you know, have no car, then, you know, may, maybe you do have a duty to make a, a, a further inquiry uh, if it's something that is, that, that is, that is, that is obvious. Uh, I think you should, as a matter of conscience and, and, and ethics, advise people that a, misrepre a misrepresenting to, representation to Social Security um, it's fraud and it, it's criminal and they do prosecute it sometimes. So uh, it, it should be avoided. Um, but I think sh short, short of that, I, I, don't, I don't believe you are exposing yourself to liability. If you are a representative payee or if you're an agency representative payee, I think you have a higher duty there. I, I think you know, it, it's been presumed since you're a red payee that the person can't manage their own uh, their own finances sufficiently for purposes of social security. So I think you would have a, you know, a duty to, uh, to dig a little farther to make sure that uh, they, are, they are revealing all of their income and, uh, and assets. And I think for this specific question, they are the rep payee. Um, so, like I was saying, if you can prove that it wasn't your fault, which it wasn't because you weren't managing the funds at that point, somebody else was responsible for managing them, and they don't have the means to pay it back, um, exclusively state that in your waiver request. And I think someone had asked what the waiver is. The form number is SSA 632, which you should be able to just go on Google and find. Um, and 
working closely with your local field office so that they know the extent of the situation because you know that would be that would be difficult if they're going to hang that over the new payees had when they had no control over the money at that point and enforce a payback but it does happen this, the ssa 632 is a perfect example of, of, of something that is misleading and confusing from Social Security. If you look at the second question, they say, check any of the following that apply. And the first is the overpayment was not my fault and I cannot afford to pay it back or it is unfair for some other reasons. If you check anything other than that, you are basically telling them you are not entitled to a waiver and, and, and you're done. And there's three, other, there's three other choices. So if you're advising anybody, if you can't get past that, if you can't check A, there's, there, there's no point in going any, in going any further. Um, so it, 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 it should be clear. They should tell you right, right there. The, you are not entitled to a waiver if you can afford to pay back some of the overpayment, which is one of the questions, uh, but they, they don't. Uh, then they ask you if you want to pay back a little each month. If you say that, then you're not getting a waiver. So I'm just throwing that out as some advice and an example of some of the misleading uh, you know, documents and information that we see. Are there any last thoughts from the panelists? Are there any questions that you wish had been asked or anything you wanna leave our audience with today? I know we've covered a lot of information. Um, I do want to say to the anyone um, viewing that um, advocacy has real power when we educate our local officials, when we educate our federal, you know, state, whoever it may be, um, and we let them know that these are issues that are affecting us, it's affecting the community, that they're real concerns. Um, it, it does have an impact and we can make changes. Uh, and the more a family or an individual themselves is part of that process, the bigger effect it has. Because if, if an agency goes and advocates to, and tries to educate someone on why these issues are, are a concern, sure, that'll be helpful. But if somebody actually comes with us who is experiencing this issue themselves, that has a greater impact. So if you are a person or a family member and you're affected by these things, please get together with um, local advocacy groups in your area and be part of the advocacy efforts because your voice will have a bigger impact on the people you're speaking with. Uh, if I could add, I, I think that um, what would help us out as an, an, an employer, and again, I'm not an expert on, on anything other than trying to hire people, is if during IEP programs, that some of this information can be slowly dripped upon the, the consumer as well as the parents so that when it's time for employment, they're aware of these issues. Because I think once they get to the uh, transition between college or vocation, that the, the, it, it, then they're gonna get inundated in all this information. If it starts to st slowly percolate out there in readable format, not all of these program details, it would be really helpful as well as uh, helping other employers. I think that's a great point. IEP meetings are so crucial for future planning, especially transitional planning. I think if you start at the age 15, 16, talking about benefits and entitlements, talking about employment, what your goals are, then we, you know, you have a team of people behind you to help properly plan for your future. And I mean, everybody knows um, how important age 18 is for SSI purposes, if maybe you weren't eligible as a minor because of your parents' household income or resources makes you ineligible and you are eligible at age 18. All, you know, a lot of those things are just aren't proactively spoken about. And so an IEP meeting would be a perfect forum to, to bring up that type of information. Um, and I just wanted to answer one last question, just so we didn't leave anyone hanging. Um, someone asked if you moved and you live in a new state, do you contact your new or old local SSA office? Um, so you want to contact your new local field office so that they can process your change of address, which is important, but especially important for SSI recipients. 
um, because they're going to have to collect information about your new household expenses and your contributions to make sure that you're still eligible, hopefully still eligible for the maximum SSI benefit. But certainly if you're on SSD or you collect off a parent's record, you definitely need to let them know when you move as well. So I would like to conclude the webinar by thanking our esteemed panelists, Chester, Howard, Simeon, and Isabel, and especially our moderator, Andrea. Um, I think we had a really great discussion today. As a reminder, um, this, will, this is being recorded and will be available both on the Institute's YouTube page and on the website. Um, and feel free, this is fully public, feel free to share it. Um, also, please feel free to read our new issue brief our new, on the benefits clip and the, its role in employment, um, also available on the website. We have another webinar on Friday, December 1st, Employment Support and the Information Ecosystem for Individuals with Disabilities. Um, which will focus on how information about benefits works, how eligibility um, ideas are transmitted to people with disabilities and their families, the role of direct support professionals, um, et cetera, in that process. You heard a lot about misinformation today. We're going to be talking about some of where that comes from and what we can do to educate professionals to avoid that. Um, and we'll be concluding this series with an in-person forum at the Institute in Albany on Tuesday, January 9th from 12 to 1.30, um, where we'll be explicitly focusing on policy solutions, both those that have been tried in other states, municipalities, also new ideas, and you know what we can do right here in New York to support and help demystify some of these predominantly federal programs. So once again, thank you panelists, thank you Andrea, um, thank you to NYSID and to the New York Alliance for Inclusion and Innovation, and thank you to our audience for asking such wonderful questions and I hope everyone has a great rest of their Monday. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you.